Hey everyone, what's going on? It's your boy, Zero Reasons to Live, and today we're taking a deep dive into the community pool full of smelly old people to unravel the Adult Swim Iceberg. Adult Swim is an American adult-oriented nighttime programming block that airs on Cartoon Network. Look, I'm not going to spend an hour with this intro, so just sit back, relax, grab some food, cuff your butthole, and get your kids out of the pool because it's Adult Swim time. I know a lot of you don't care about intros, so timestamps will be in the description below if you want to skip around to different sections of the video. So the chart we'll be using for this Adult Swim video was crafted by me, but let me give credit where credit is due. First of all, shout out to the following people who made these awesome charts on screen because they really did aid in the creation of my own chart for this particular video. I've not only incorporated a lot of their chart entries and ideas, but I've also introduced a bunch of new original ideas to my chart as well. I also want to give a big shout out to the creator of this particular iceberg chart, Wilfred Cthulhu. He again not only made this chart, but he also created his own explanation series on the chart on his own YouTube channel. His iceberg series really helped answer a lot of questions that I had. And I just want to give one more quick shout out to a YouTuber named Dantavius who created an iceberg video based on Wilfred's chart and it was a fantastic video. I'd highly recommend giving those guys some love. If I'm being honest, Adult Swim is filled to the brim with secrets and lore that I could probably make a part two to this video at some point. If you guys are hardcore Adult Swim fans and you have any other entries that you feel belong on this particular chart that I did not cover, then leave your suggestions down below in the comments. Also, if you want to add some information to an entry or you feel like I made a mistake somewhere, leave a polite comment down below. If you don't like the video and you find my voice to be annoying or you just have something nasty to say, then uh, I don't know. Go complain to your boyfriend about it or something. If you're not familiar with an iceberg or how it works, here's an example of an iceberg chart on screen. The top portion of the chart is information about a topic the iceberg represents that 99% of everyone who is invested in the topic knows and understands, but the further we dive down, the weirder the entries get and the less people know. With all that out of the way, if you guys are excited for this video, then give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Without further ado, let's get started. Bumpers. For those of you who don't know exactly what a bumper is, let me briefly explain. A bumper, or just a bump for short, are those little short transitions you see on the Adult Swim channel during each commercial break. The first set of original bumpers Adult Swim utilized were just shots of senior citizens swimming in a public pool while a lifeguard yelled, Adult Swim, all kids out of the pool. All kids out of the pool for Adult Swim. The lifeguard would also announce the lineup of shows for that particular night. The senior citizen bumps ran from 2001 to 2003 when Adult Swim decided to change the bumps to animated safety manuals demonstrating techniques with the characters of the upcoming block. And on May 25th, 2003, Adult Swim did another rebrand, this time going for a more simplistic style. They changed the logo from the black circle with the red text to what we all now know as the current Adult Swim logo that being the channel name in between two brackets. Around this time as well, Adult Swim would begin showing black intertitle cards with white text on them. And these cards would comment on anything from current events to staff opinions to just random stuff. Adult Swim would also introduce all of us to the world of Mandir by Kachalanza Denise Laskombi. You know that Indian music that used to play during the old bumpers? Yeah, you have definitely heard of this jam before. I bet I just unlocked a core memory inside of your brain. As Adult Swim continued to evolve over the years, so did the bumpers. Bumps would continue to grow and evolve with photos of Tokyo, to the dawn is your enemy, to random photos of buildings and houses, to nature, to show specific bumps, to just odd and mesmerizing, to downright scary and terrifying. Let's talk about some of the odd and mesmerizing bumpers first. Syriac, an animation YouTube 
YouTuber, was actually hired to create some bumps for Adult Swim based on his very unique style of animation. You have definitely seen his bumps before. Adult Swim also made bumpers for specific shows that were airing on the channel, but one bump they did for a syndicated show really stood out to me, and I think a lot of you are going to agree with me. The King of the Hill bumpers, they were just so unique and added something a little extra to the hour-long King of the Hill time slot. And then of course we have the creepy unforgiving bumps that used to terrify me as a child. I mean, obviously now being a grown-ass 22-year-old adult, the bumps don't necessarily scare me anymore. In fact, I think I'm in love with them. I think they're pretty incredible. I mean, I'm a big boy now, but damn, when I was six years old, these bumpers used to make me piss and shit myself so much. Like the commercial for the heart she holler. I remember when Adult Swim, during the middle of a regular commercial on their network, it would be for like the Cleveland Show or Family Guy or something. They would literally splice together the Cleveland Show or Family Guy commercial with the heart she holler. So I would be in my room late at night thinking, oh, you know, new episodes of Family Guy are coming out. That's pretty exciting. And then out of nowhere, this bitch, this stupid fucking demon would just appear in the middle of the commercial for a split second and I would instantly shit. There would be shit all over. There was fecal matter covering the walls, and the floors, and the ceiling, and it wasn't a fun time. Anyway, I could sit here and talk about the bumpers all day, but we kind of have a busy schedule ahead of us, so let's just jump right into the next entry. Adult Swim saved Family Guy and Futurama. I know that many of you Adult Swim junkies out there know damn well what the network did for the adult animated series Family Guy, but for those of you who don't know, Family Guy was in fact saved by Adult Swim, and also Futurama, but let's start with Family Guy. So Family Guy used to be a staple series on Adult Swim for years, airing primarily in the beginning hours of Adult Swim with reruns later in the night. But before that, Fox was probably the only network to air the series. However, back in 2002, Fox decided they wanted to cancel the series after three seasons. After its original cancellation, Cartoon Network came to the rescue and aired reruns of the first three seasons on Adult Swim. Because of this decision, the Family Guy fan base ultimately exploded in popularity. Viewership of Family Guy was up so much that Fox reversed its decision and brought back Family Guy once again. Unfortunately, after the Disney-Fox merger and Adult Swim syndication rights for the series expiration on September 18th, 2021, Family Guy left Adult Swim and began airing exclusively on the Disney-owned cable networks FX, FXX, and Freeform. The very last episode of Family Guy to air on Adult Swim was Season 13, Episode 12, Stewie is on Sunt. After this episode aired, the Adult Swim network showcased a brief video where characters from different Adult Swim shows like Aqua Teen, Space Ghost, and Bird Girl waved goodbye to the Griffin family. And to be honest, it was a pretty bittersweet ending if I do say so myself. Of course, things could change in the future, but as of now, now Family Guy will continue to air on Disney-owned channels. Now Futurama, on the other hand, that was also canned from Fox, but was revived on Adult Swim. The numbers and ratings increased, and Comedy Central ended up making like four straight-to-DVD films, and the show even made a comeback, or it's actually making yet another comeback. Technically, American Dead was also saved by Adult Swim. It was canned from Fox like every other show, and once it started airing on Adult Swim, the channel TBS picked up the show and began airing new episodes which are then aired on Adult Swim shortly afterwards because technically TBS owns Cartoon Network and Adult Swim. Turner Broadcasting System. Oh wait, I forgot that the assets are now owned by Warner Bros. Discovery. I can't keep up to date with these company mergers and acquisitions anymore. Like, it's there's so much going on. And don't even get me started on Fooly Cooly, The Oblongs, Samurai Jack. I, I mean, there's tons of shows. We should be thanking Adult Swim for giving these shows a chance to shine. We should be sucking Adult Swim's <laughs> Moving on. Boston Moon and Night Bomb Scare. So I did briefly touch on this in the Aqua Teen Iceberg, go check that out, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail this time around. Ah, Boston, the capital city of the great state of Massachusetts, mostly known for baked beans, Fenway Park, the bar from Cheers, and very loud people. I'm kidding, Boston. Unfortunately for the population of Boston, they would all soon face a tragedy so tragic that, oh, well, wait, 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 I see here, yes, yes. Uh, this wasn't a tragedy. This was a complete misunderstanding. Alright, all jokes aside, let's talk about how Aqua Teen Hunger Force scared a large portion of the Boston population. So back in November of 2006, Boston area artist Peter Burdovsky, who goes by the pseudonym Zebler, was hired by Interference Inc. to work on a promotional project. Burdovsky agreed and enlisted Sean Stevens to help out. Interference shipped the guys 40 electronic signs and a list of where to put the signs and some do's and don'ts. In January of 2007, the signs were placed throughout 
the city of Boston and the gentlemen were each paid $300 for their service. The two men also filmed themselves placing the signs throughout Boston as a way to prove to Interference Inc. that they completed the task they were originally instructed to do. And on the morning of January 31st, 2007 at roughly 8.05 a.m., a person spotted one of the devices on a stanchion that supports an elevated section of Interstate 93 above Sullivan Station. An army of police cruisers, fire trucks, ambulances, and even the Boston Bomb Squad showed up. The Bomb Squad ultimately used a small explosive filled with water to destroy the electronic sign as a precaution. Throughout the rest of the day, more signs were identified throughout the city. Basically, the entire city of Boston was on pause for one entire day because of this fiasco. As it turns out, the Boston Police Department and the Boston Fire Department mistakenly identified battery-powered LED place cards depicting the Moon Knights from Aqua Teen Hunger Force as an improvised explosive device or IED, which led to a massive panic. These signs were placed throughout Boston and in multiple United States cities like New York, Seattle, Chicago, and more as part of a nationwide guerrilla marketing campaign for the upcoming Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie, which was scheduled to release in April of the same year. The city's response to the devices was met with controversy and criticism from media sources like the Boston Globe, LA Times, Fox News, New York Times, and more. A lot of these sources ridiculed the city's response with statements like how disproportionate and in indicative of a generation gap between city officials and the younger residents of Boston at whom the ads were targeted. Several sources also noted that the hundreds of officers in the Boston Police Department or City Emergency Planning Office on scene were unable to identify the figure depicted for several hours until a young staffer at former Mayor Thomas Menino's office saw the media coverage and recognized the figures. Obviously, lots of people were pretty upset and even claimed that emergency services overreacted to the whole shebang. And tons of others were pretty Pretty pissed at the entire stunt for making a lot of people paranoid, as if it was a terrorist attack of some kind. Berdovsky and Stevens were eventually found and arrested by Boston police during the evening of January 31st, 2007, and were charged with placing a hoax device and disorderly conduct. On February 5th, 2007, state and local agencies came to an agreement with both Turner Broadcasting and Interference Inc. to pay for costs incurred in the incident. Turner paid $1 million to the Boston Police Department and an additional $1 million to the Department of Homeland Security. The company also publicly apologized. Charges were dropped against Brodovsky and Stevens in exchange for community service and a public apology. I do want to mention that during a press conference with Brodovsky and Stevens, they mentioned nothing about the incident because they were told to keep their mouths shut about it, and instead, they talked about haircuts. There was a rumor floating around the internet. If I could find it, I'll put it in this video, but if I can't, then I'm really sorry. But I saw somewhere online that there was a rumor claiming that Brodovsky and Stevens were using this tactic to promote another Adult Swim original show called Perfect Hair Forever. I don't believe this rumor to be true. I, I don't think anybody finds this to be true at all. While we're on the topic of the Boston Moon Knight panic, believe it or not, if you're an Aqua Teen fan, then you already know this, but if you don't know, the writers of the show actually worked on an episode titled Boston, which was essentially the creator's response to the bomb scare. The episode was supposed to be released within season 5, but Adult Swim canceled the episode to avoid further controversy. However, the unfinished episode was leaked online in January of 2015, and you could watch it right now if you really want to. I'm not saying that you should, but if you really want to see it, you could just look up Aqua Teen Boston episode on like archive.org. It's honestly a great episode despite the unfinished visual. You know, despite the fact that Adult Swim wanted to avoid any further controversy surrounding Boston and get its ass blasted by its big boy father, Turner, on January 21st, 2022, 15 years after the Boston incident, literally this year, the official Adult Swim Twitter account poked fun at the event and included an image of a knickknock giving the middle finger with text that reads 131-2007, never forget. And by god, I will never forget that date. April Fools. There is only one television network, Uno Television Network O, that has and continues to have the best April Fools pranks ever. Yes, you are correct. Spike TV. No, you stupid idiot head. Yeah, I just called you a dumb, stupid idiot head. Well, what are you gonna do about it? You gonna cry? 
You gonna shit? You gonna piss your pink? <clears throat> uh, yes, Adult Swim. Ever since 2004, the network has celebrated April 1st by playing a joke on its viewers, and sometimes the pranks are silly, sometimes they're cruel, and sometimes they're like gifts from the gods. Starting way back in 2004, for Adult Swim's first ever prank, all regularly scheduled shows that night were aired with mustaches drawn onto characters. The next night, April 2nd, the same block of shows was played only without the mustaches. In 2005, instead of a scheduled episode of Robot Chicken, an unfinished version of the Squid Billy's pilot episode aired, followed by an announcement of the show's official premiere later that year. In 2006, reruns of 1980s cartoons like Mr. T and Chuck Norris Karate Commandos aired, followed by episodes of the original Full Metal Alchemist and Ghost in the Shell standalone complex with added fart noises to the dialogue, and Boo Boo Runs Wild also aired in place of Neon Genesis Evangelion. In 2007, we actually got a double prank. So on March 31st, 2007, every episode of the Adult Swim show Perfect Hair Forever was played in reverse order in place of the Saturday night anime lineup with the visual quality having been digitally degraded to look like old VHS tapes of poorly fan subbed anime. One episode even had the subtitles for an Aqua Teen episode instead, which is really funny. And of course, on April 1st, 2007, the infamous Aqua Teen prank commenced. Adult Swim promised to air the entire Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie in its entirety several weeks before its theatrical premiere date by showing the already available first two minutes before airing the rest of it in a small one by one inch box in the corner of the screen as the block ran episodes of Futurama, Family Guy, and even Aqua Teen itself with commercials, bumpers, and, and advertisements of the Aqua Teen movie. This was the first Adult Swim prank I was ever exposed to as a child and I was very disappointed. I was a very disappointed six year old child. This prank was cruel and I'm still mad about it to this very day. Despite the fact that I own the movie on DVD and can literally watch it whenever I want, I'm still very upset. Set. In 2008, unfinished sneak peeks, pilots, and stealth episode premieres of upcoming and currently airing shows like Super Jail, Fat Guy Stuck in Internet, Metalocalypse, Moral Oral, Robot Chicken, and Adventure Bros premiered. Also included with this lineup were the premieres of pilot episodes of Delocated and Young Person's Guide to History. They also premiered the Aqua Teen movie in full this time. In 2009, the network aired the infamous cult classic movie The Room directed by Tommy Wiseau, and to keep it classy for cable viewers, they censored the sex scenes with black boxes. I remember waking up in the middle of the night as a child in 09 wondering why the hell there were black boxes covering my TV screen. But as I got older and discovered the room and Tommy was so, I kind of picked up on why my TV was full of black squares. So thanks a lot Tommy was so. In 2010, the room was aired once again, this time with bumpers featuring Tommy was so being interviewed on Space Ghost Coast to Coast. In 2011, The Room aired for a third time, this time followed by a 15-minute special titled Earth Ghost, a version of a pilot shown on the Adult Swim website a few years prior, with the main actor George Lowe replaced by a CGI version of Space Ghost. Okay, enough with The Room, I've seen it like 10 times now. In 2012, The Room premiered- God! Damn it. I'm kidding. In 2012, after a fake out opening utilizing the room, the screen switched to Tom, the host of the defunct Toonami animation block, who noted the date and revealed that he is back from the dead for one night only, with the channel airing episodes of older anime associated with the Toonami block for the rest of the night. This was the best prank Adult Swim has ever pulled on us. I witnessed this prank as a kid, and it was so incredible to see Toonami back on the air, even if it was for one night only. And it was, until Adult Swim asked if the fans wanted Toonami to come back permanently. I just hit my microphone. And because of the crazy amount of support and love from fans all over the world, Toonami officially returned for good one month later and continues to exist today showcasing some great shows. In 2013, there were cats. Nothing but cats. Cats everywhere. Every show and bumper had images or videos of cats, while live action programming had cat faces covering those of the actors. The Adult Swim logo at the bottom corner was even replaced with Meow Meow. However, the only show in the lineup that was exempt from this prank was Loiter Squad. 
In 2014, two new episodes of Perfect Hair Forever were aired eight years after the series finale, followed by a Space Ghost Coast to Coast marathon featuring creator chosen episodes including the uncut version of Fire Ant, which had until then not been seen since its original premiere in 1999, and it also included outtakes and commentary from the writers and staff which aired during commercial breaks. In 2015, there was an Aqua Teen Hunger Force marathon that featured a version of the Coin Hunt game from Adult Swim's online series. Fish Center, where the characters got points by hovering over coins that have been added to the episodes. In 2016, Adult Swim released a bump, recapping previous years of pranks and claiming that 2016 will be just as grand. However, there was no prank in 2016, which I guess is technically a prank. I mean, they pranked all of us into thinking that there would be one, but there really wasn't. In 2017, we got another double prank, baby. On March 31st, after midnight, each show was given new audio mixes that replaced the regular audio with auto-tuned speaking voices, laugh tracks, Seinfeld strings, and various sound effects. And of course, on April 1st, the evening portion of Adult Swim was replaced with the unannounced and unscheduled premiere of the first episode of Rick and Morty's third season, The Rick Shank Redemption or the Szechuan Sauce episode, which aired repeatedly until midnight. However, this stunt really pissed off angry fans of Dragon Ball Super and Samurai Jack. In 2018, Toonami broadcasted their block with English subtitles for the entire night, from dialogue spoken by Tom and Sarah during the bumpers, to the programming itself being the original Japanese versions, including JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders, and Hunter x Hunter. Even the logo and the bumper text were all in Japanese. At midnight, the first episode of Fooly Cooly alternative premiered without any announcement five months before its official air date, followed by Masaki Yuasa's Mind Screw film, Mind Game. Then on April 2nd, in place of a scheduled Rick and Morty rerun, a parody cartoon called Bush World Adventures created by YouTube animator Michael Cusack was aired for the remaining hour before midnight. In 2019, the network premiered a new Mind Screw series, Gimuseto, which was unannounced but leaked by trademarks and Hulu. Gimuseto is a tennis-related anime-esque series with six hours long episodes. Also without announcement, the new Adult Swim channel in Canada Soft launched at midnight to air the same programming which interrupted a show called The Visit which was the final program of its predecessor, Action. In 2020, the night began with another fake out opening but instead of The Room, it started off with the second season of Gemuseto but then Post Malone cuts off the show leading it to a night of stealth premieres and bumpers surrounding a beer pong game that Posty was playing with his friends. The premieres included new episodes of Primal, Dream Corp LLC, Tig Tone, The Shivering Truth, Robot Chicken, the trailer for the back half of Rick and Morty Season 4, and the series premiere of J.J. Villard's Fairy Tales, along with the Smiling Friends pilot and YOLO Crystal Fantasy. Apparently, the Rick and Morty Season 4 trailer that premiered that night ended up being a prank itself in retrospect, which presented many shocking moments like Rick and Morty facing the army of the Citadel, Sneffel's return, and a lightsaber fight between Summer and Tammy, but come the premiere of the episode Never Rick and Morty. After this, the clips were moments created as alternate storylines by the anthology train and not canonical with the series. In 2021, we received Adult Swim Jr., which was allegedly spoofing the then-upcoming preschool block for Cartoon Network titled Cartoonito. Shows were dubbed over using children's voices with curse words replaced with more child-friendly terms. Bumpers were also written in a childlike font. The logo was done up like a preschool channel. Theme songs were rewritten like a preschool show. The titles of the shows were also changed as well. For example, Aqua Teen was now Aqua Child Hunger Force. Rick and Morty was Rick and Morty Babies. The advertisements were also done in childlike animation. However, at 1.30 a.m., the lineup returned to normal. And this year, in 2022, the block started with the first few seconds of the Learning with Pibby short, which was released in October of 2021, before cutting to the outside of the, of the Sanchez house where Pibby and Bun Bun briefly remained on screen before being chased away by the glitchy blob-like substance that predominantly features in the short. This kicked off a regular enough schedule featuring reruns of Rick and Morty, Smiling Friends, The Eric Andre Show, Aqua Teen, Bird Girl, and Joe Para Talks With You, but with cameos from Pibby and an increasingly corrupting Bun Bun inserted throughout alongside glitches directly interacting with the characters and locations. This even extended to the bumpers and nature interludes. Once Joe Para finished, another Rick and Morty and an episode of Futurama aired without the Pibby interruptions. 
The schedule then looped again with the Pibby interruptions present again. The event broadcast as a whole could actually be found on the Adult Swim YouTube channel, and I'd highly recommend you check it out when you get a chance. Toonami and falling in love with the anime. This entry is just talking about Toonami, some of the cool stuff they did with the program block, and sharing my personal experience with being introduced to the world of anime. So Toonami is a programming block that primarily broadcasts Japanese animation and occasionally American action animation. Random fact I want to throw in, but the word Toonami is a combination of the words cartoon and tsunami. Anyhow, the block first premiered on March 17th, 1997 and was considered the Maltar era. In the Maltar era of Toonami, the block would broadcast on, on weekday afternoons and was hosted by Space Ghost villain turned producer Maltar, who was voiced by the late C. Martin Crocker, who's done tons of other voices for Adult Swim like Dr. Weird from Aqua Teen, for example. Then in 1999, Toonami rebranded by retiring Maltar and replacing him with Tom and his ship, the Ghost Planet Spaceship Absolution. Then throughout the years, there would be newer versions of Tom, like Tom Era 2 from 2000 till 2002, Tom 3 era from 2003 to 2007, and then Tom 4 era from 2007 to 2008 before Toonami ended up being shut down in 2008 due to low ratings. Anime would still play every Saturday night on Adult Swim just without the Toonami bumps. But like I mentioned before, during April 1st, 2012, Adult Swim aired the Toonami block as a prank, then asked the internet the next day if the fans wanted Toonami to return, and thanks to the lovely bastards at Adult Swim, Toonami returned a month later and brought a whole lot of anime and Tom. And to this very day, Toonami continues to air on Adult Swim every Saturday night. Toonami, when I was a kid at least, was my first real introduction to anime. Well, kinda. Pokemon was technically my first anime, but Toonami introduced me to Naruto, One Piece, Dragon Ball, all of the classics. But there were a few key moments in my life that made me so grateful for Adult Swim introducing me to anime at such an early age. When I was younger, a little show by the name of Inuyasha would play for one hour hour every single morning right before I had to wake up for school, which now that I think about it, that wasn't on Saturday. I think Inuyasha just used to play like every other night. It doesn't matter, shut the hell up, it's an anime. I remember waking up early to watch the show, and once the show ended and the dawn is your enemy bump came on screen, I knew that my mom or dad was going to wake me up for school, which kinda sucked, but damn, I enjoyed every single second watching Inuyasha early in the morning. No. I savored those moments from watching Iuyasha every morning. Hell, I, I, I might just start re-watching it right now because I love that show so goddamn much. Another key moment for me as a child was staying up to watch Full Metal Alchemist, both the original and Brotherhood. I love Brotherhood a lot more than the original, but let me tell you something, the original was really cool too. Christ, watching Bleach every Saturday was awesome, The Dudada, which is like one of my favorite shows of all time, Cowboy Bebop, The Big O, Jesus Christ, there are so many good shows, Ghost in the Shell, God, I could go on forever. Fully Cooly, I really looked forward to Saturday nights when I was a kid, because I knew that Saturday night was going to be anime night, and I savored every single second of it. Honestly, in my own opinion, if Toonami and Adult Swim never played anime, I do not believe it would be as popular here in the West as it is right now. Anime is so popular in the West currently, but when I was a kid, either nobody knew what it was, or they all thought it was just fucking weird. Anyhow, Toonami is a gift from the heavens, and if Toonami asks me to get on my knees and open wide, then I would do so, because I owe it to my life. Infomercials. So Infomercials is a series on Adult Swim, and it's like the paid programming of the network, except all of the programs are fictitious, and for the most part, maintain no continuity with each other. There are essentially 15 minute sketches that premiere on Adult Swim, typically around 4am, and most of the sketches resemble the format of infomercials while others parody tropes in niche media such as industrial films, sitcoms, outdated reality TV formats, and public access television. Let me put it to you this way. Have you ever heard of too many cooks? Unedited footage of a bear? Perhaps this house has people in it? Those three iconic short sketches are in fact a part of this infomercial series. The infomercial series started way back in 2009 when David Cross and H. John Benjamin wanted to create a series called Paid Programming for Adult Swim. They wrote and created a pilot episode titled Paid Programming, Icelandic Ultra Blue, or just Icelandic Ultra Blue. The sketch is about an ad for a health pill called Icelandic Ultra Blue, created by Dr. Torsten Samuelson. At one point, the doctor comes on screen and tells viewers that it's retiring its catchy slogan and wants fans and viewers to create a brand new slogan. So, for the next 11 minutes of the sketch, 
it just cuts away to random people trying to create a catchy slogan for Icelandic Ultra Blue. The whole bit just feels kinda like a fever dream. Honestly, you should just watch it for yourselves, because my description doesn't do this video justice. Icelandic Ultra Blue aired at 4am from November 2nd, 2009 to December 4th of the same year, and the sketch received negative feedback from fans because this sketch took up the 4am Aqua Teen time slot for a whole entire month. Paid programming ultimately did not get picked up for a full series, but Adult Swim greenlit more fake infomercials in 2012, just a few years later, and Icelandic Ultra Blue served as the pilot episode. And that's when we started to get crazy shit like too many cooks and unedited footage of a bear and this house has people in it. There's a theory that I saw somewhere online, I'll have to find it for this video, but if I can't then you're just gonna have to take my word for it, dude. But I saw somewhere that the reason why these infomercials would air at 4am was because the creators and execs wanted to mess with people who were either high off of their asses or just kids who decided to stay up way too late or just woke up at 4am. It's kind of a sick prank. <laughs> Actually no, it's, it's a very funny prank. I love infomercials. Adult Swim TikTok Trend I don't really see a point in adding this to the iceberg except it was a pretty iconic moment in history and I kinda want to talk about it for a couple minutes, okay? Greg, you got a problem with that? Huh? I don't know why, I just have a vendetta for people named Greg. Anywho, last year, 2021, Adult Swim was blowing up on TikTok. But why was that? Well, everyone on TikTok became nostalgic over Adult Swim and their world-famous bumpers that aired in between programs. It literally became a TikTok trend to film a bumper and include the AS somewheres in the video while an audio clip created by a user named Vano3000 called Time Move Slow Remix by Bad Bad Not Good plays in the background and it was probably the coolest and greatest thing to ever come out of TikTok because let's be honest with ourselves people, nothing great has ever come out of TikTok. I believe the origin of this trend was actually Vano3000. He first recorded himself eating a sandwich while the audio played in the background, then he uploaded another video saying the sound goes with everything and using the Adult Swim logo. Soon after that, everyone on TikTok began to mirror him and soon the trend started to take off. And according to Forbes, there have been over 1.1 billion uses of the hashtag Adult Swim and 82.7 million of Adult Swim bump on TikTok at the time of this article being written, so it probably went up. The trend blew up so much that even Adult Swim themselves played into the trend, which was really cool. But that, my friends, was the first layer of the iceberg. The Dawn is your enemy. So I could have included The Dawn is your enemy in the bumpers entry in the first layer, but I feel like this particular bump deserves its own entry because of how popular it is amongst Adult Swim fans, and how incredibly deep the lore behind this particular bump goes. So The Dawn is your enemy was a sign-off bump that was shown on Adult Swim between the years 2005 and 2010, and the point of the bump was to scare the ever-living Christ out of children from watching the channel, hence why it would appear early in the morning. The bumper shows a pencil sketch style image of a pair of human-like eyes gazing over a field covered with flowers and trees and in the distance a sun with a face can be seen. And for 10 seconds every morning for 5 years this image would appear on screen with a very creepy audio track playing in the background. So like I previously mentioned before in the Toonami entry, I would see this bump every single morning as soon as Inuyasha ended. Surprisingly, the bump never really scared me as a kid. Like, the only thing this bump ever did for me was remind me that I had to get my prepubescent ass ready for kindergarten that morning, which was pretty upsetting. But now, I'm an adult. I haven't had to worry about school in about four years now. In fact, the only things I worry about now are my future and my life, and whether I'm going to make it to the age of 30 or if I'm going to die alone. Anywho, sometime around May of 2000. 20, a decade after the end of the original bump, it made a surprise return in the form of a text bumper called The Dawn Is Your Frenemy, which begins with a text that reads, We're going to be more positive to see if it makes us feel better before cutting to the original bump, except the text now reads The Dawn Is Your Frenemy as opposed to Enemy. Eventually a red balloon floats up into the air followed by upbeat piano music playing, and just as you think it can't get any weirder, the sun f***ing winks at you, before cutting to an on-screen text that reads, Not sure 
sure if it's working. And then the advert ends. Really crazy how self-aware Adult Swim is and how much they pay attention to the fans and their theories and ideas on what the bump could mean. Now besides that bump, the full original bump for The Dawn Is Your Enemy appeared for a short time in September of 2021 in honor of Adult Swim's 20th anniversary, which I thought was pretty cool. But besides those two instances, according to some people on the internet, the bump allegedly appeared post-2010 even in between commercial breaks, albeit on extremely rare occasions. However, due to the unpredictable nature of Adult Swim bumpers, there is not much proof to support this rumor. Of course, being that the bump gives off scary vibes with the music and the unnerving feeling of it, people on the internet decided to make some creepy pastas and stories and just lore in general to add onto the creepy, spooky, ooh woo nuzzleness of the bump. And now I'm not sorry for what I just said. One particular creepy pasta about the dawn is your enemy can be found on the creepy pasta wiki. I'd highly recommend checking out this narration video by Paradox Noctis. They do a very great job at capturing the creepy nature of the creepy pasta. But if you want a brief summary, I'm assuming most of you watching this video have at least seen this bump when it was still on TV. Do you guys remember how it was only about 10 seconds long? Well, this creepy pasta tells the story of why the bumper is no longer in use. One morning, probably the last morning the bump was ever played on TV, someone at Cartoon Network and Adult Swim played an extended version of this bumper on air where the audio of scraping metal gets louder and louder and you can start to hear people screaming in agony. It basically sounded like tons of people were being murdered to death. The network supposedly received dozens upon dozens of phone calls from angry parents asking what the hell was happening because the extended version of the bump was so horrifying to listen to that children were scared and parents and other adults in each household were freaking out as well. Right as the bump was being taken off air, the sun in the background can be seen winking at the viewer. Which if you guys remember in the original bumper, the sun never winked once. The sun winking was always always a rumor. Most people will tell you that the sun never winked once in the original bumper, but some people believe, they swear on their moms, that the sun always winked. And of course, this creepypasta plays into that rumor. And like I mentioned previously, when Adult Swim did the Dawn is your frenemy bumper, the sun winked. Again, it's really cool how self-aware Adult Swim is and how much they listen to the community. But going back to the creepypasta itself, the question that remains is how Cartoon Network got that audio in the first place. The audio of screaming and agony as if tons of people are being murdered simultaneously. A lot of people on the internet enjoy this creepypasta, but others feel that it lacks in certain places. Sorry, my dad was sneezing in the background. <laughs> Anywho, if you were a fan of this creepypasta or you've always been a fan of this creepypasta, then there's some good news for you. There is a fan-made version of the Dawn is Your Enemy bump uploaded by a YouTuber named IKJLeoCH where the bump is extended up to a minute and a half and the sun actually winks at you and the audio adds in the screaming people in the background just like the creepypasta described. So if you're a fan of that particular creepypasta, then you might really enjoy this extended version of the bump. It's really good. There's also another version uploaded by a YouTuber called Movie Tales, which gives the sign off a creepy VHS recording vibe, and it's really cool too. Oh, and before I forget, you know how the sound of the dawn is your enemy just feels like a bunch of mashed up sounds put together? Well, it turns out we were listening to the intro of a hip hop song the entire time. So credit to Just Extreme on YouTube, they uploaded two videos of The Dawn Is Your Enemy with both the full song and the instrumental where the 10 second sound of The Dawn Is Your Enemy was sampled from. According to Just Extreme, the song is called Violence Is A Menace by Bola Adikimi from the album Root. So if you guys are ever in the neighborhood and you want to listen to the full song with The Dawn Is Your Enemy bump in the background, just go to Just Extreme's channel and you can check out the instrumental and the full version of the song. Aqua Teen creators lied to get the show on air. So I did in fact touch on this entry in the Aqua Teen Hunger Force Iceberg video. Make sure you go check that out by the way. But basically Dave Willis and Matt Malero created three fast food chain mascot characters for a Space Ghost Coast to Coast episode that ultimately did not get made until after Aqua Teen was a well-established show on the network. Dave and Matt fell in love with the character so much and they decided to just create a whole show around it. The problem was that Cartoon Network executives did not fully understand the vision that 
that Willis and Matt had. Which is why in the first few episodes of the first season of Aqua Teen, Shake, Frylock, and Meatwad are detectives. Because if Matt and Dave pitched the idea to the network about talking food, doing random things, the network would have probably said no to the idea. The creators went down the detective route with the show in order to get the okay approval from the network. But by the fourth episode, Mayhem of the Moon Knights, Willis and Malero were comfortable enough to drop the whole detective disguise altogether. And then the show became random food, do random things. However, once in a blue corn moon, whatever the hell that means, the characters in Aqua Teen bring up their detective days, and it's pretty nostalgic. Of course, like I previously mentioned in the Aqua Teen Iceberg, Dave and Matt explored the detective idea once again in Season 8 of Aqua Teen, titled Aqua Unit Patrol Squad 1. Seth Rogen's phone number. In the season 3 premiere of The Eric Andre Show, Seth Rogen unfortunately became the victim of a very terrible prank. Now, besides flashing Seth Rogen his dong and duping him into jumping through a flimsy set wall, Andre also displayed Rogen's real phone number on screen. Yes, that was Seth Rogen's old phone number. He had to change it because of this stunt. The amount of phone calls and text messages from fans pissed off Rogen so much that he literally tweeted Andre asking him to tell everyone to stop calling him. What's interesting and quite hilarious is that years later Eric Andre appeared on the Conan O'Brien show on TBS and both of the hosts broadcasted Seth Rogen's phone number once again. However this time around Seth was very much in on the prank. Like when Conan calls Seth back he tricks Seth into giving out his brand new phone number. I've had to get a new phone number just stop it. Okay, well, uh, that's, sorry about that, uh, Seth. How do we reach you then in the future? Oh, it's 323-834-2079. That's not his real phone number either, or his new one. That was all a part of the bit. But yes, at one point in history, Eric Andre leaked Seth Rogen's phone number. And it was awesome. Well, I mean, not awesome for Seth Rogen, but pretty entertaining for all of us. Dexter's Rude Removal. So Dexter's Laboratory was a very popular Cartoon Network staple that I grew up with. One of my favorite shows that I was fortunate enough to see as a kid, and I thought I had seen every single episode of the show, but that was a complete lie. It turns out there was, I guess, a lost episode of Dexter's Lab, if you want to call it that. I mean, it's not lost anymore, but for the longest time, there was a rumor of an episode of Dexter's Lab that was banned, and the rumor turned out to be true. The episode of Dexter's Lab that was banned from airing on Cartoon Network was an episode called Rude Removal that was intended to be a part of season 2. And the reason why the episode was rejected from airing on the network was due to the characters swearing even though the profane words themselves were censored out. You guys remember that episode of Spongebob where Spongebob and Patrick are outside the Krusty Krab at night reading curse words off the dumpster and then reciting them not knowing that they're actually very bad words? This episode is kind of similar except while Spongebob and Patrick were very oblivious to what they were saying, Dee Dee and Dexter know exactly what shit and crap and piss and fuck are. So the episode only aired at some animation festivals like the World Animation Celebration in 1998. However, Adult Swim managed to find a copy of the episode and uploaded it to YouTube and AdultSwim.com on January 22nd, 2013, before it was taken down on January 25th of the same year. So the basic rundown of the episode is that Dexter creates an invention called the Rude Removal System to get Dee Dee's rude behavior under control. Her antics end up accidentally putting her and Dexter into the machine, resulting in essentially splitting the good and evil of Dexter and Dee Dee. I believe Rick and Morty did something similar to this plot in the episode Rest in Ricklaxation, but don't quote me. In one pod, Dee Dee and Dexter emerge as pure, innocent, and kind, while in the other pod, there are evil and nasty versions of the siblings. Versions that really, really like to curse. And you know, being that Dexter was a kid's show. When I saw the entire Rude Removal episode, I was actually pretty impressed. I mean, there was no way in hell the episode was ever going to air on Cartoon Network at the time, but I often wonder if it was actually meant to air on the network to begin with. Like, I don't think the creators were trying to hide this episode from viewers or anything. I'm just curious if this episode was made for the creators to enjoy themselves or if they actually believed that Cartoon Network would let this episode slide. Now, like I mentioned before, in the original episode, Rude Removal, the curse words are censored. However, there is a video 
on YouTube titled Dexter's Lab, Word Removal Uncut, which gets rid of the censor sounds and replaces them with the characters actually saying curse words. I'm not 100% positive if this uncut version is actually legit or if this was just a fan made redubbing the curses. I mean, if you pay extra attention to when Dexter and Dee Dee curse, you could hear some distortion in the audio that makes it sound like sentence mixing, which is a technique used in a lot of edits, like for YouTube poops or that one video where Donald Trump sang Unravel, the uh, Tokyo Ghoul Season 1 theme. So to me, it might be fake, but who really knows, right? Anyway, if you want to watch the full episode of Rude removal, you could easily find the full episode online, probably on archive.org or even YouTube. But if I were you, I would just check out the uncut version on YouTube because it's pretty entertaining to hear Dexter say shit and fuck, even if the sounds are distorted at times. Pictures of shows that ended up on Cartoon Network. So throughout the network's history, there have been dozens upon dozens of shows on Cartoon Network, some of them feeling a bit more adult-oriented than others, and I guess a little more LSD-oriented if you want to be that type of person. And it kind of makes you wonder if some of these TV shows were originally meant for Adult Swim but got picked up by Cartoon Network instead. Well, it turns out that there are some shows that have been pitched to Adult Swim but ultimately landed on Cartoon Network instead. The biggest example of this was a show called The Problem solvers, one of the strangest, trippiest shows I have ever seen in my entire life. The show follows three characters, Alfe, Robo, and Horace, who are detectives and try to solve problems in their town of Farborough. The animation is wild and vibrant and extremely saturated and very exhausting to look at. At first glance, this seems like it would be a perfect show for a network like Adult Swim, and you would be correct, good sir. The creator, Ben Jones, pitched a pilot to Adult Swim featuring the trio but the network executives referred Jones to Cartoon Network who ended up taking the show and running with it. There's no public reason why the Adult Swim execs denied the show and referred Jones to Cartoon Network, but my guess is that maybe the show wasn't really adult oriented, or that it just seemed a bit too kiddish for the network, or maybe Adult Swim just wasn't interested in general. Maybe the Problem Solvers was originally going to be more adult oriented, but when the show got picked up by Cartoon Network, they had to tone down the edginess if that ever did exist. I don't know, my friends. Anyway, that show ended up burning in flames. Another show I want to talk about in this particular entry is Sunday Pants. Sunday Pants is a very old and quite possibly foreign show to a lot of you. The show aired on Cartoon Network from October 2nd, 2005 to October 30th of the same year. The show lasted 11 episodes, but only the first five were ever aired on TV. So it definitely had a very short run on television, but I remember watching the first three episodes with my nephew when we were younger, and it was a very odd experience. By the way, shout out to my nephew. He's got a podcast with a couple of his friends. Definitely check it out. Sunday Pants was essentially a 20 minute show featuring various overseas shorts, pilots, college shorts, or just shorts in general for the show itself. Live action, animation, the show was essentially like a sketch show, but just with different animation styles. This program was the second original series on Cartoon Network to be rated TVPG. Despite not airing on Adult Swim's lineup, it was considered more of a traditional adults animated comedy than a children's cartoon, which leads me to believe that this show might have also been pitched to Adult Swim at one point, but they just didn't want it. Is that confirmed? No, it's not. I'm just theorizing, but I think a majority of everyone who has at least seen Sunday Pants can agree to a certain extent that it was one of the strangest Cartoon Network shows on the channel and it just felt like it would have been a better fit on Adult Swim. Plus the show aired every Sunday at 9.30, hence the name Sunday Pants, and that was basically before the Adult Swim block started. So maybe Cartoon Network realized that it was a bit of an odd show and played it safe by premiering it in the last half hour of the kids block before Adult Swim started? I mean, who really knows? Not me. I know nothing, except your phone number, your credit card information, and your social security number, but that's besides the point. Ha ha ha. I'm joking, by the way. Please don't tell my mom. I've also seen people online talk about how regular show might have also been pitched to Adult Swim before Cartoon Network and that the creator JG Quintel wanted to go a more darker route with the TV show. And the evidence to suggest that is one, the 2006 video title 2 in the AM PM, which was created by Quintel and it showcased early versions of Mordecai and Benson working at a gas station and tripping 
stepping on acid. Two, when regular show ended, Quintel got to work on a more adult-oriented show in the same style of regular show called Close Enough. And of course, three, regular show itself did have some edginess to it. If you've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. There were some jokes in regular show that really stuck out to me as a child. Now, it's not confirmed if regular show was ever pitched to Adult Swim first, but it kind of feels like it was, or at the very least feels like it should have been. But either way, it doesn't matter because the show was fantastic, okay? Now get off my lawn. Anywho, The Problem Solvers is the only show that I talked about that was confirmed to be pitched to Adult Swim at one point before landing on Cartoon Network. Everything else is just solely speculation. Metalocalypse Change.org Petition Metalocalypse, one of Adult Swim fans' pride and joy, was last seen in 2013 with a musical special titled The Doomstar Requiem. This episode saw the dark prophecies surrounding Death Clock come to life. With Charles Oftenson no longer their manager and Murderface corrupted by an evil force, series creator Brendan Small had planned to wrap up the show with six final episodes including a series finale called Army of the Doomstar. However, due to budget negotiations with a Adult Swim falling through, Brendan turned to fans, starting a petition called Metalocalypse Now. The petition encouraged fans to send guitar picks to Hulu, urging them to make a deal with Adult Swim to pick up the final season and even show at a rally in front of the site's headquarters in Santa Monica, California. And even real-life musicians like Devin Townsend and Scott Ian from Anthrax showed their support. Eventually, Adult Swim saw the outcry and commotion from fans and responded to them in the biggest troll since they pranked us all with the Aqua Teen movie on April Fools in 2007. The network let fans fill out forms and submit them to the offices and if they got at least 25 signatures they would sign the actual change.org petition to bring the show back. The catch is that the form had to be at least 125 words on why the show should be brought back and had to be faxed to the network's offices with the note that Adult Swim's endorsement of this petition in no way whatsoever will bring back Metalocalypse. And to add insult to injury, Adult Swim even live streamed their fax machine receiving petitions and throwing them into a bin. Fans ended up faxing other things like pictures of Nicolas Cage and some not safe for work memes in response. This clip uploaded to YouTube by Swim History shows that Adult Swim stuck to their word and signed the petition. As of the time of me making this iceberg, the petition to bring back Metalocalypse is at a staggering 105 thousand signatures. Thankfully, Adult Swim finally caved in and is actually giving Metalocalypse fans some closure. In case you guys did not know, last year Adult Swim announced that three original movies based on Aqua Teen, Venture Bros, and Metalocalypse were in the works and would be straight to DVD and HBO Max in the year of 2022, which is this year. There's been no word or update for the Venture Bros and Metalocalypse movies as far as I know, but I do know that Dave Willis mentioned in a recent interview that they were finishing up the Aqua Teen movie in May and were aiming for a summer release, although I did also hear from somewhere that Dana Snyder mentioned a fall release. Nobody knows anything though, we just have to be patient. But hey, at least we're getting movies for these three classic shows. And that, my friends, was the second layer of the iceberg. Lost April Fool's Footage According to Wilfred on Reddit, a lot of the April Fool's footage in the early days of Adult Swim that we previously talked about is considered lost. So let's go through and take a look at what was lost and what was actually found in archive. Before we start, let me preface by saying that shows that aired on nights of April Fool's are 99% available to watch whether it's on a streaming service or online on some third-party illegal streaming website hosted in, I, I don't know, Vladivostok. There are exceptions to certain shows like little edits, but we'll get there when we get there. Starting in 2004 with the mustache prank, the Futurama mustache episode from the 2004 prank has actually been uploaded to archive.org, so that's available for you to check out. Apparently, the Witch Hunter Robin mustache episode that aired the same night was allegedly found on an old site called myspleen.com, but isn't available or I guess uploaded to the archive. I would say go check it out on myspleen, but it's virtually impossible to get into myspleen now. But there are screenshots available from when the mustaches were applied. Same with the rest of the lineup from that night as far as I could tell. You know, Family Guy, Cowboy Bebop, and Inuyasha as well. All those episodes in full with the mustaches 
are unfortunately just lost pieces of media as far as we know, unless Adult Swim just has them somewhere, which is totally possible. In 2005, the Squidbillies unfinished pilot that aired was also posted to MySplain a very long time ago, but is available on archive.org for you to check out. The Space Ghost presentation talk show featuring Early, Meatwad, and Sharko airing from that night is also available on the Adult Swim YouTube channel, and according to Just Extreme in the comments section of Wilfred's video discussing the lost April Fool's media, they mentioned a rumor that Adult Swim had mustaches once again for the remainder of that night, according to an unknown form, but nothing is confirmed. In 2006, Adult Swim aired Full Metal Alchemist and Ghost in the Shell standalone complex with fart noises added to the dialogue. Half of the Ghost in the Shell episode with farts that aired that night is available on archive.org along with the entire FMA episode, minus the intro and outro to avoid copyright. In terms of the 80s cartoons that aired that night, like Mr. T, Chuck Norris, Karate Commandos, and Boo Boo Runs Wild, you could easily find those shows online if you search hard enough. In 2007, during the Perfect Hair Forever marathon, Adult Swim aired bumps which included sexual pictures of various female characters from anime that aired on the network, such as Faye from Cowboy Bebop and Haruko from Fooly Cooly, with the caption saying, Fan Service Moment. This was a historical moment because it shows that Adult Swim was the inspiration behind why people in 2022, like me, and other degenerates, go to Spencer's or Hot Topic and buy t-shirts with anime bitches being choked on them. God damn it. Anyway, those bumpers are available on bumpworthy.com. As for Perfect Hair Forever, you can find that show on the Adult Swim website, but in terms of the altered Perfect Hair Forever episodes that aired that night, I'm not quite sure if they exist online or not. If someone knows for sure, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. In terms of the entire Aqua Teen movie block, i.e. the entire movie being shown in the corner of the screen for an hour and a half, to my knowledge isn't available, but you can find the first two minutes of the prank on YouTube and archive.org. According to this user on Reddit, the entire block with the Aqua Teen movie is out there online, so I'll search for it, but if I can't find it, then I'm very sorry. In 2008, some of the unfinished sneak peeks for the upcoming shows that aired that night are apparently lost, but I did manage to find two bumps for the Aqua Teen movie that also premiered that exact same night, and those bumps are available on archive.org. In 2009, the bumps from The Room are allegedly on bumpworthy.com. In terms of the movie The Room, you can find that bastard online, but I'd recommend buying yourself a Blu-ray copy from Tommy Wiseau's website because it's one of the greatest films of all time, and I'm not kidding. Pieces of the space Ghost Tommy Wiseau interview from 2010's prank are available on Bumpworthy if you just search Tommy Wiseau. I did manage to find the CGI version of Low Country that was aired in 2011, actually both versions of Low Country. The original and the CGI with Low replaced the Space Ghost or Earth Ghost. They're both available on the Adult Swim website. I believe most if not all of the Toonami bumps from 2012 are available online on bumpworthy.com, which is great. They're probably also available on YouTube as well. The bumps from 2013 are available online, but as far as the shows go, there is only a few screenshots. Being that this was a weak April Fool's year, I'm not surprised a lot of footage wasn't archived. Basically everything from the 2014 Space Ghost Coast to Coast takeover seems to be available available online along with the new episodes of Perfect Hair Forever. Check out the Adult Swim website for Perfect Hair Forever. I would check YouTube or Bump Worthy for the Space Ghost bumps. In terms of 2015, the bumpers from the Aqua Teen Coin Hunt game are available on YouTube. There are also screenshots of coins appearing on screen along with the Coin Hunt logo in the bottom right instead of the Adult Swim logo. In terms of footage, I did find this one clip, which is pretty cool. The hype bumpers from 2016's Lack of a Prank are available on YouTube. Various pieces of footage from the March 31st, 2017 prank are available on YouTube. Obviously, the shows that aired that night are available to watch, but the full episodes with the Seinfeld stings, voice changes, and laugh tracks, to my knowledge, are not available. And of course, the Rick and Morty episode from April 1st is available to watch whenever. Plenty of bumpers from the 2018 prank are available on YouTube, along with the Australian-themed bumpers that were showcased. All of the shows from 2019 are available. As far as I know, there weren't any crazy exclusive of bumpers to air that night, but I could totally just be an idiot. All of the 2020 bumpers are available on YouTube thanks to Swimpedia. And for 2021, the Adult Swim Junior Prank bumps are available on YouTube and archive.org, but I cannot find 
the Rick and Morty and Aqua Teen redubbed episodes. Allegedly, they were available on archive.org at one point, but I believe they were taken down. 2022's prank is actually available to watch in full on the official Adult Swim YouTube channel if you just search for Adult Swim Special Broadcast. They essentially archived the full prank for everyone. Hopefully they start doing this more often because, well, it just makes our lives easier and the Adult Swim archive community's lives easier as well. Besides that, that's all that is missing and what has been recovered in archives so far in terms of Adult Swim pranks. Hanna-Barbera assets and other shows. I'm combining this entry with what is essentially the origins of Cartoon Network and Adult Swim. So Hanna-Barbera Cartoons was an American animation studio and production company that started in 1957 by Tom and Jerry creators and former MGM cartoon studio staff William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. They produced tons of the classics like The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, Johnny Quest, Scooby-Doo, The Jessens, Space Ghost, all of those shows. And in 1991, Turner Broadcasting acquired the production company and started airing the old classic shows on Cartoon Network, the first 24-hour all-animation channel in 1992. There was no original content on Cartoon Network for the longest time. It was literally just reruns of Hanna-Barbera classics and also some MGN and Fleischer Studio shows too. That was because Turner didn't give the network any money to essentially create original content. However, the network was able to repurpose the obscure assets from Hanna-Barbera that they owned. And one day in 1993, Mike Galazzo, the senior vice president of programming and production for Cartoon Network, got sick and tired of hearing about how the network is just a Hanna-Barbera rerun station and wanted to create some new original content. Lazo was a big fan of Space Ghost and he really wanted to revive the character after being inspired by the talk show war between Jay Leto and David Letterman at the time. He came up with a concept to make Space Ghost a talk show host which turned into Space Ghost Coast to Coast. A two-minute pilot was developed in a closet with interview footage of Denzel Washington. The unaired pilot was shown to execs and it earned Lazo and the network enough money to produce five episodes. So because Cartoon Network essentially had the rights to reuse obscure Hanna-Barbera properties, Mike Lazo paved the way for Adult Swim and future original programming on the network. Eventually, the network decided to create more shows out of the assets, like C-Lab 2021. The Brack Show and Harvey Birdman Attorney of Law also featured Hanna-Barbera assets, but used new animations featuring classic characters instead of what Coast to Coast and Sea Lab producers did, which was repurpose older animations and overdubbed the voice tracks. Aqua Teen Hunger Force is another prime example of a show reusing Hanna-Barbera assets. You can really notice the Hanna-Barbera style in the very early episodes of the series. 12 Ounce Mouse and Perfect Hair Forever also use a lot of Hanna-Barbera stock characters in their shows. Before the next entry, I just want to share with all of you the philosophy of Adult Swim in a now-deleted Reddit comment. This user claims that there was an interview with Mike Lazo on IGN where he explains that him and the team realized that they needed to create new original content instead of completely showing reruns of old tunes. They literally had no budget for anything new, and Ted Turner was like, every great thing starts from nothing. So they got to work on Space Ghost Coast to Coast after they finished working late into the night for free. After its success, this paved the way for Adult Swim's philosophy on shows, even now, which is to work on them with an extremely low budget. Not only to keep costs down, but creativity is sparked from these do-or-die scenarios. Even when they brought back Toonami in 2012, everyone working at Toonami was working for free. I really like this philosophy, and it just goes to show that all you really need to create whatever you want, whether that's a television show or music or a YouTube video is the motivation and passion and drive and also some already owned assets from not so popular Hanna-Barbera TV shows. I'm just kidding, all you need is motivation. Space Ghost Bee Gees Interview So I'm combining the Bee Gees interview and the Space Ghost interview process into one entry because in order to fully understand the Bee Gees interview, you have to know how the interview process for Coast to Coast used to work. Okie dokie. So before any of the episodes were written, the guests were interviewed by a crew member who would sometimes wear a Space Ghost costume. The interviewer dressed up also instructed the guest or guests to address him as Space Ghost to maintain continuity. After an interview was shot, the writing crew went back over it, taking pieces out of context and out of order, assembling them into the responses to Space Ghost, 
and the rest of the cast. When it came time to interview the Bee Gees for the first Coast to Coast episode, the band could not stop laughing at the interviewer. I don't know how true this is, so don't quote me, but people have stated online that Andy Merle, voice actor who played Brack on The Brack Show in Coast to Coast and Oglethorpe in Aqua Teen, allegedly conducted the interview with the Bee Gees. He allegedly put on a Space Ghost costume and talked to the Bee Gees in a Shakespearean accent and started asking questions like, do you have enough oxygen? Once again, the band kept laughing the entire time and cursed quite a bit. And as you know, Coast to Coast predates Adult Swim, so it wasn't exactly made for adults, so sadly a lot of the interview had to be scrapped. If you're wondering why the Bee Gees only showed up on screen for like 20 seconds in the first episode of Coast to Coast, if you've seen the episode, it's because the producers could only find about 20 seconds of usable footage from that interview. I guess you could technically say that the rest of the unusable footage from the Bee Gees Coast to Coast interview is lost footage. The crew of Coast to Coast have gone on record stating that the Bee Gees were one of, if not the worst guests they've ever had. They continued the interview process with a random person dressed up as Space Ghost around four or five more times until figuring out that it wasn't a great idea anymore and eventually they opted for asking guests questions through a phone patch which would result in guests staring at bright lights and being told to imagine talking to a superhero. The end of Moral Oral. Okay, look, this entry is going to get pretty dark at certain points, so if you want to just skip over this entire entry, go for it. The next entry is us discussing the witches abusing babies controversy, so just skip a little bit forward until you see some witches abusing a baby. For all of you watching during the premiere of this iceberg, and you want to just skip over the entire entry, just pause the premiere for like 10 minutes and then come back afterwards. But for those of you who want to continue forward with this entry, Let's get into it. So Moral Oral was an American stop-motion animated show created by Dino Stamatopoulos that premiered on Adult Swim on December 13th, 2005 and ran until December 18th, 2008. The basic plot summary for anyone that just needs a quick refresher is that the show focuses on devoted Christian Oral Puppington and his family who live in the fictional 1970s town of Moralton in the capital of the fake US state, State Soda, located in the Bible Belt of the United States. The series only lasted three seasons, but was supposed to continue with a fourth and a fifth. Unfortunately, the show was canceled for being too dark and too depressing for Adult Swim. So what exactly did Adult Swim mean by too dark and too depressing? Well, it all had to do with a season three episode titled Alone, AKA the final nail in the coffin for Moral Oral. This episode isn't really based around Oral or the family. In fact, only a snippet of Oral's dialogue can be heard in the beginning of the episode, but that's about it. Instead, we get to focus on three side characters. The episode starts off with Nurse Bendy, the town harlot. If you don't know what a harlot is, let me put it to you this way. She's basically been with every guy in town, and the guys really enjoy her assets. But in this episode, we get to see a whole different side of Nurse Bendy. In layman's terms, she's mentally a child. Her home is filled with toys and colorful walls, and her mannerisms are that of an elementary school kid. Nurse Bendy can be seen talking to stuffed animals which are seated at her kitchen table, one of which is named Hubby Bear. It's alluded that Nurse Bendy might be suffering from paranoid delusions and PTSD from past trauma, which is why she regresses to a childlike state at home. She's very afraid that people only care about her for sex and just wants someone to recognize that she's a real person and feels sad and afraid in addition to happy thoughts quoted by her in the episode. Her home and stuffed animal friends are her escape from the dreadful outside world. She knows that once she leaves the comfort of her home, all of the town's men will be right back after her. Hubby Bear, one of the stuffed animals, suddenly falls onto Nurse Bendy while she's cleaning the floor. The bear lands on Bendy in a very suggestive position. To Nurse Bendy, this meant that Hubby Bear was only friends with her for sex. The only place that she felt safe, her home, is no longer safe. She then panics in the corner of her kitchen, and that's how the Nurse Bendy section ends. Each story cuts back and forth between each character, but part way through the Nurse Bendy saga, we see Agnes Sculptum, Moral's teacher. She was unfortunately by the ice cream man, Cecil Creepler, and as a result deals with a lot of trauma. She ended up becoming pregnant, and according to the bloody hanger on her kitchen table, she aborted the child herself. She then learns that Cecil has died in jail from the radio broadcast. 
and it freaks her out. She starts to desire Cecil despite everything that happened to her, and in the beginning of her scene, debated on leaving her door unlocked or not. What's interesting about this particular scene is that there's actually no dialogue in this story besides Reverend Putty and a newscaster on the radio. Everything about this story is supposed to be visually analyzed. Part way into Miss Sculptum's story, we get to see Miss Center Doll in her apartment. She grabs an egg from her refrigerator and lays with it until she decides to call her mother back. In the shot, we see a miniature Moralton with some dialogue that would have foreshadowed the future of the series if the show didn't get cancelled after this episode, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Miss Censor Doll calls her mother and explains that her obsession with chicken eggs is due to the fact that she does not possess human eggs herself, because when she was an infant, her mother had her sexual organs surgically removed. She then states that she is immaculate from conception, basically meaning that she believes she's perfect and free from flaws. The rest of season 3 continued to air as scheduled, but after the episode alone, Adult Swim pulled the plug on the show. Dino the creator confirmed that there were 7 finished episode scripts that Adult Swim chose not to produce due to the show's cancellation and their decision to roll back the number of season 3 episodes from 20 to 13. He then put out the scripts on his MySpace page. If season 3 continued with 20 episodes and wasn't canceled, the season would focus on Oral's grandfather moving in with the family, Oral becoming a goth after his grandfather dies, Bloberta escaping her depressing marriage and finding new love, and the lives of the other characters in town as well. Oh, remember how I stated that in the episode alone, Miss Censor Doll had a replica of Moralton and said a few lines that would have foreshadowed the future if the show didn't get cancelled? Well, apparently, in the cancelled season 5, Miss Censor Doll was going to take over Moralton. How, you might ask? I have no clue, Dad. <laughs> there was a special that released in 2012 titled Before Oral Trust, which was essentially a prequel to the Moral Oral series, and it focused on four-year-old Oral and the origins of his religious nature and also the birth of his brother Shapey. There was also a bonus episode of season 3 titled Abstinence, which was finished after the producers learned that the show was cancelled. The episode was rendered in a very ugly style using clay figures, since the animators lacked access to the puppets they normally used to create each episode. The episode centered around Dolly instead of Oral, and was screened once at a special live event called Sunday with Moral Oral on January 18th, 2009. But on May 26, 2015, the series animator, David Tuber, uploaded the episode to his YouTube channel, and you, my friends, could watch it if you are a big Moral Oral fan, that is. It's a real shame that the show got canned for being too dark because it really was a great show and it had so much potential with the latter half of season 3 that was ultimately cut along with the alleged 4th and 5th season storylines. But in retrospect, the episode alone was pretty dark. But anyway, that was the dark, depressing end of Moral Oral. And honestly, after digging into the Moral Oral ending, I've managed to find so much information about the show that I never even knew existed. Like, I could literally make a moral oral iceberg or analysis video if I really wanted to. Is that something you guys want to see? Let me know in the comments below. Which is abusing babies controversy. Alrighty, in order to fully understand the art of being a witch and abusing a baby, we need to first learn about Off the Air Sound. So Off the Air Sound is an American anthology series that airs on Adult Swim. Every episode is essentially composed of surreal videos of different media and purposes animated in live action short films, clips from featured films, and other television series, stock videos, music videos, abstract loops presented continuously and in succession. In other words, it's random shit. Like if you want a prime example of a great anthology movie, watch VHS 94. Once you watch that movie, you'll understand what an anthology is. Anywho, on November 12th, 2018, content creator, film director, musician, and special effects artist Mike Diva uploaded a video titled Pre-Birth to his YouTube channel and in the description he wrote that this particular animation was a short made for the Adult Swim show Off The Air Sound. And in fact it was because a couple weeks prior to November 12th, so late October of 2018, the video aired on an episode of Off The Air Sound. The video is currently sitting on almost a million views and has received mostly positive feedback from viewers. The synopsis of the video pre-birth is basically three human-like figures wearing all black who also have pyramid-shaped heads standing in the middle of a desert in front of three monolith type structures with more giant monoliths in the background. The middle figure dispenses an infant child onto the monolith from its pyramid mouth and then grabs it by the legs and just slams it onto the monolith. 
The figure then conjures another infant from the sky and uses the two baby infants as drumsticks and creates a pretty sick dubstep beat. The two other figures next to the middle figure then find some infants and also use them as drumsticks or beat makers or whatever the hell you want to call them. And for the rest of the duration of pre-birth, these three beings are beating the snot out of these babies while also making a pretty gnarly song. Then at the end of the video, a baby is placed on the first monolith and the structure then descends into the ground. And the final shot is a doctor pulling that same exact baby out of a woman in a hospital. And the video is basically about what happens to babies or what babies go through before they are shot out of the womb. It's a very unique animation and I highly recommend giving it a firm watch. Now, seeing clips of this short, would you think that this video was, I don't know, inappropriate for Adult Swim? Maybe satanic? Yeah? Y yeah, you think? Yeah, well maybe you should get your eyes checked, Grandma. In terms of content from Adult Swim, this was one of the tamest pieces of art I have ever seen, and yet, for some unexplainable reason, a Twitter user on July 18th, 2020 posted about the short with the caption, Cartoon Network after hours, they throw it in your face. They hope you aren't the kind of parent who monitors what your kids watch and do. They're busy conditioning them. What do you see here? I see witches abusing. This is not okay. This is not funny. There were some idiots siding with this person claiming that the short was inappropriate and not suitable for kids and questioned why it was on a children's network. And of course, those people and this person got roasted or, uh, in Gen Z terms, ratioed on a massive scale thanks to smart and educated people who not only realized that Adult Swim has been around for almost two decades at the time of that story going viral, but that the network lets your children know that it's not suitable for them before the block even starts. Therefore, it's the parents' job to make sure that their kids aren't watching bad stuff at night. You know what? I think Peter Griffin of all people said it the best. Maybe you shouldn't be letting your kids watch certain shows in the first place if you have such a big problem with them, instead of blaming the shows themselves. So Mike Diva, the creator of the short, responded to the controversy on Twitter with the following tweet. Adult Swim is now trending because the QAnon Karens are losing it over a vid I made about Pyramid Boys playing drums with shitty CGI babies. While getting accused of being an Illuminati pedivore daily has been fun, let it be known that I do not condone any form of CGI baby drumming. And Adult Swim finally responded in the best way possible to the controversy. They tweeted, the first bump viewers see when Cartoon Network signs off for the night and the adult block starts. Talk about a fucking ratio. No, 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 no. A murder. It's a good thing this person only saw the pre-birth video. Like, like, imagine what they would have done if they found out about too many cooks or your pretty face is going to hell. That's literally a show about being a demon that works in corporate for the devil in hell. Million Dollar Extreme presents World Peace Controversy. Alright, listen up sisters. Disclaimer. I am not with nor against Sam Hyde and Million Dollar Extreme. If you're a fan of Sam's work, then cool. If not, then cool. I really don't care whether you find Million Dollar Extreme and Sam Hyde to be alt-right and offensive or just a bunch of funny comedians who like to make edgy jokes. I'm going to stay as neutral as possible for this entry. Okay, with that out of the way, Million Dollar Extreme was a sketch comedy troupe which consisted of Nick, Rochford, Charles Carroll, and Sam Hyde. The group got picked up for a post-ironic comedy series on Adult Swim titled Million Dollar Extreme Presents World Peace, which premiered on August 5th, 2016. However, the show was immediately cancelled on December 5th of the same year. So what exactly went wrong? Let's start off with Sam Hyde. Sam is a very controversial comedian and public figure. His style of humor has been described as post-ironic, as he regularly blurs the distinction between himself and his characters. Basically, it's kind of difficult to tell whether Sam is being sarcastic or not. His transgressive style has also garnered public controversy as he has frequently been associated with the alt-right, including making monetary donations to an anti-Semitic editor of an anti-Semitic website who needed to pay some legal fees. Sam has also been frequently misreported as the perpetrator of numerous shootings and attacks by people on 4chan and even Twitter. Like honest to Buddha, Sam Hyde is a rabbit hole. There's tons of lore surrounding the guy. If you really want to learn a lot about Sam Hyde in greater detail, then there's definitely a lot of documentaries on YouTube that you can check out. You could even watch some of Sam's videos and even sketches from Million Dollar Extreme that are available on YouTube. And at the end of the day, you my friend could decide for yourself whether you believe that Sam is a crazy deranged maniac who shouldn't have a platform 
or just a guy with big balls who doesn't care what people say or think of him. Any whore, BuzzFeed news writer Joseph Bernstein was active in criticizing the MDE sketch show and even released a hit piece of sorts titled The Alt-Right Has Its Very Own TV Show on Adult Swim. Joseph wrote that a source told him the network standards and departments reportedly discovered and removed coded racist messages in the sketch show. However, Hyde addressed the allegations in a video response asserting that the claims were false. Some adults when workers were okay with MDE, but others were very vocal about their dislike for the sketch comedy trope. Adult Swim series creator Brett Gelman claimed that the show was an instrument of hate. He ended up leaving the network shortly afterwards, and not just because of world peace, but also because of Mike Lazo's alleged comments regarding women in the workplace. The network did not want to take any chances with the show after the BuzzFeed article was written and ultimately pulled the plug on the show. Sam's YouTube channel at the time was also terminated and the subreddit for Million Dollar Extreme also met the same fate. The comedy troupe broke up shortly afterwards and went their separate ways. And of course, after every media outlet was labeling the show as alt-right, there was no chance in hell the guys were ever going to get a TV show again. The show did really well on the network, but Adult Swim ended up pulling the plug on the show to save itself from the controversy, which like we've mentioned previously in this video, Adult Swim is not a stranger to avoiding controversy. For example, they shut down the Aqua Teen Boston episode real quick. Allegedly, the network faced internal oppositions to the show's continuation, mainly regarding accusations of Hyde's alleged connections to the alt-right. According to Hyde, despite Adult Swim's executive's interest to pick up the show for a second season, Turner, the parent company, ultimately decided to cancel the show. The day that the show was canceled, a post about the cancellation reached the front page of the r slash the Donald subreddit calling for a boycott of Adult Swim. The following day, Hyde tweeted that those who want the show to return to put pressure on Turner and that he would make an announcement video the following day. The tweet, however, was deleted and MDE never returned. Following the cancellation, musicians whose work was featured on the show, including Molly Nielsen, Chastity Belt, Ovlov, and Three Teeth, disavowed the show. Apparently, those acts were not aware of Million Dollar Extreme's beliefs or political views prior to meeting them or viewing their work. At the end of the day, though, like I stated before, you are entitled to believe whatever the hell you want. If you want to do some research on Sam Hyde and Million Dollar Extreme, watch some old sketches of theirs, and then come to a conclusion, that's fine. Whether you find Sam Hyde to be problematic or a national treasure, that's all on you, baby. But either way, MDE having a TV show on Adult Swim did stir up some controversy. Lost Adult Swim ARG In August of 2017, a mysterious bump played on Adult Swim one night. Its name was Delilah, or Designated Emergency Logics Intelligence Level ARC Habitat. Delilah isn't sure where she came from and asks us, the viewers, to help. And the bumper ends with a Twitter handle, at Lil Head in brackets. Dozens of people came together that night online to figure out what exactly the bumper meant and eventually figured out that it was in fact the start of an ARG. An ARG, or an alternate reality game for those of you who don't know, is an interactive networked narrative that uses the real world as a platform and employs transmedia storytelling to deliver a story that may be altered by a player's ideas or actions. Essentially, it's like a quest or a puzzle that involves elements of a fictional world brought into the real world. The goal of the ARG is to have players or a community of players in the real world interact with elements of the fictional world, whether it be characters or events or timelines. ARGs tend to involve a series of puzzle solving, such as deciphering codes, as well as real world coordination. Have you guys ever solved the Call of Duty Black Ops 3 Zombies Easter Egg? It's kinda like that, but on steroids. In the case of the Adult Swim ARG, us, the viewers, the players in the real world, are trying to interact with Delilah in the fictional world. When you search up Lil Head on Twitter, you're brought to an account with two tweets. Hashtag, we need to save her, and hello to those of you joining us in saving Lil Head. We don't have a ton of information, but stay with us. There has to be more to come. And if you're curious about the username Lil Head, it's just an anagram for Delilah. To keep things brief, this ARG existed for a few years, resurfaced a few times, but became very non-linear and eventually fell apart. At this time, Adult Swim did let go of some team members, and what people assume is that the creator or creators of the ARG were part of the employees who unfortunately lost their jobs, which is why there haven't been any new updates to the ARG. There's a video on this exact ARG that goes into the specifics of the story and what exactly happened towards 
the end of its life cycle. It's called The Lost Adult Swim ARG, and I'd highly recommend giving it a watch. It was uploaded by Red Herring, and it does such a great job going into the details of the ARG, showcasing the bumpers, talking about the story, etc. You'll really like it if you're into ARGs. Amazing Art Styles versus Crappy Art Styles. This entry was added on, I believe it was Wilfred's Iceberg, but essentially what this entry entails is that Adult Swim shows can vary in terms of style. Like, the network has shows like The Boondocks or Orgeny Tartakovsky's Primal, and I'm also going to throw in the final season of Samurai Jack as well, but then you have shows like 12 Ounce Mouse. Like, 12 Ounce Mouse is a fantastic show, do not get me wrong, but if someone were to judge Adult Swim shows based on style alone, they would probably believe that 12 Ounce Mouse is a fucking train wreck. It's just crazy how insane the diversity is between Adult Swim shows and their styles. Like, Rick and Morty looks so different compared to Aqua Teen, which looks different from Mr. Pickles and Robot Chicken. Like, each show is very distinct and doesn't blend in with one another, and I think that's fantastic, but let's be honest with ourselves. Shows like Primal and The Boondocks look fantastic compared to 12 Ounce Mouse. Robot Chicken Nintendo Direct 2014. So I'm actually just learning about this right now, but it turns out that in 2014, Nintendo finally grew some balls and decided to poke fun at itself with the help of Robot Chicken. Apparently, and this might be subjective, but between the years 2011 and 2013, Nintendo had very bad, underwhelming press conferences or showcases at E3. So Nintendo decided to take a step back from in-person conferences and allow itself to be the butt of a joke. The conference turned into a bit from Robot Chicken. Yes, Seth Green and a production team for Robot Chicken collaborated with Nintendo to bring the greatest Nintendo Direct in history. Ah, if only they'd do it again. If you want to watch that Robot Chicken Nintendo Direct, it's on YouTube. But that, my friends, was the third layer of the iceberg. Too Many Cooks Meaning. So I explained earlier in this video that Too Many Cooks was a short sketch that was a part of the infomercial series, but I want to take this opportunity to explore different theories and meanings behind the Too Many Cooks short. Now anyone could just say that Too Many Cooks is just a random Adult Swim sketch that was created for entertainment and has no deep, dark, mysterious underlying meaning behind it. But what often makes an amazing piece of art is its ability to be interpreted in numerous ways. So to some of you, the sketch is just a sketch, but to others, it gets deep. To some of us, it takes a lot to make a stew, a pinch of salt and laughter too, a scoop of kids to add the spice, a slash of love, god damn it. Anyway, that philosophy can easily be applied to too many cooks and two more entries that we're going to discuss in this particular layer. But whoa, 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 easy there, cowboy. Let's start off with too many cooks. So sit your ass down. So I would say that the biggest theory that a collective group of too many cooks fans could agree on is that too many cooks is full of symbolism on how network executives always win, destroying unique shows and running show creators out if they don't conform. Show creators can fight back constantly against the network, but they can never truly win. Basically, network executives spoil the broth. This is a very, very, very long read, and the theory does contradict itself at certain points, but if you want to read it for yourself, then go ahead. It's probably the best theory involving too many cooks that I've personally ever read. That being said, there are many more theories to go off of. There's a theory that the sketch was just for entertainment, and that it was meant solely to mess with stoners and children who happen to be up at the 4 a.m. mark. Again, the sketch is up for interpretation. These guys guesses are as good as yours and mine. There's a theory that the father of Too Many Cooks, the first person introduced in the sketch, is actually sick with the disease he obtained in Too Many Cooks and that the entire sketch was just constructed in his head due to his illness. And personally, I think this is a pretty weak theory, but what the hell do I know? I'm not a doctor. A YouTuber by the name of Nothing Explained made an entire video talking about some of the Too Many Cooks theories that we just previously discussed, but I actually wanted to dive into the comments of of that particular video because there are a ton of different theories and ideas from dozens of people that I feel are worth sharing in this video. So Pink Girl 50 said that they thought that the video was about the way in which audiences blindly consume media. We are presented with the same things over and over with slight differences. The killer represents the audience as we place ourselves within these shows and we end up killing any chance of creativity through our blind consumption. 
And I think this is a pretty interesting theory. Anyway, this person believes that the segment is more about the viewers and how typecasting hurts shows. When you associate an actor strongly with a role and they show up in a different show, the shows they have been in kind of mess with the viewers' expectations. You can just as easily argue that Too Many Cooks is more about the viewers' demands as they make one show that is supposed to cater to everyone. Too Many Cooks is easily summarized as a show that panders to everyone at their collective lowest common denominator. Many people find sitcoms the lowest form of entertainment life. This person believes that Too Many Cooks was a commentary on the human condition, population, and how we as humans are ruining the earth and our own lives. The characters representing all of the different types of people, serial killers, nuclear families, easy girls, and Smurf represented nature and what we are doing to the environment. But if you want my honest opinion on what I believe Too Many Cooks means, I think Night Soldier summed it up perfectly. Honestly, I think it's Adult Swim just doing what Adult Swim has always done. F***ing randomness. I think Too Many Cooks is just a sketch meant for entertainment. You watch it, you consume it, and then you go about your day reading Vogue magazines and listening to audiobooks or whatever it is you do. But I'm curious to hear what your interpretations of Too Many Cooks are, so if you want to, leave them in the comments below. William Street Hammer Origin. So this is a fun little entry. Oh my goodness. You guys know how at the end of like every single Adult Swim show, you see the William Street logo with the audio that sounds kind of like something being hammered? Well, that audio is actually reused from another company. So Mark 7 Limited was a production company of actor and filmmaker Jack Webb, who has starred in classic shows like Dragnet. His production company was operational from 1951 to his death in 1982. Mark 7 Limited was known for its famous production logo attached to the end of its productions. In the logo, it shows the hands of Jack Webb's construction foreman Harold C. Nibai holding a stamp against a sheet of metal. As the timpani roll played, he struck two blows on the stamp with a hammer and then removed both tools to reveal the Roman numeral 7 indented into the sheet. And like I said before, the production company's logo was very recognizable during its time and has become very iconic with many instances of filmmakers and production companies paying homage to it in various ways. That's where William Street comes into play. William Street utilized the same drum roll, hammer, clink sounds seen on the 1967 Mark 7 logo. So next time you hear that hammer sound while the William Street logo is on screen, make sure you pay some respect to Jack Webb because without Mark 7 Limited, we wouldn't have that cool hammer sound. Sound. Every viewing of Adult Swim is personalized. So this entry was featured on Wilfred's original Iceberg chart and I wanted to include it on mine because I think it's a pretty neat theory and concept. If I'm not entirely mistaken, I believe Wilfred said something along the lines of how the channel gave you specific feelings to soothe you or to put you in a state of melancholy or even fear and that the network caters to each person that watches the network. Basically, your experience with Adult Swim might be different than someone else's. You might see a bump or a commercial that someone else has probably never seen before. Hence why the title of this entry is Every Viewing of Adult Swim is Personalized. The theory is that the network quite literally caters to you and your feelings. There were entries on Wilfred's Iceberg chart like Pirates of the Caribbean Sneak Peek that I did not include on my chart because I don't remember ever hearing anything about that when I was younger. Same thing with the Falcon Punch bumper. These types of bumps just never appeared for me. Now granted, they could have played at some point on the network and I just don't remember them. You know, maybe I was asleep. Or maybe, just maybe, they never played for me at all. Maybe they only appeared on screen for only a few people to see. Maybe I saw some bumpers and footage that no one else saw before. Who really knows? Okay, like I said, this is just a theory. It's a fun little idea. Don't worry, I'm self-aware. And I understand that this concept is complete bullshit. But listen, it's fun to speculate and imagine things from a completely different perspective. Wolfred even uploaded a video under the same name. He took clips of different bumpers and mashed them together to create this creepy, horrific video with a backstory behind it. And it's just really cool. I would definitely give it a watch if you get the chance. The meaning behind unedited footage of a bear. So I would say that the overall meaning of unedited footage of a bear is that drugs are bad, but let's actually get knee deep in some Claridrill bussy and figure out what the tits is happening. <laughs> I crack myself up and it's really sad. So a YouTuber by the name of Nightmind made a whole analysis video on unedited footage of a bear. He talks about the hidden meanings and themes behind the video, how there's actually a Claridrill website that you can check out which is riddled with 
story information. I'm just going to give you guys a basic rundown of his analysis, but please, for the love of God, check out his analysis video because what I'm about to tell you doesn't even compare to what Nightmine explains in his video. So the woman in the advertisement taking Claire Drill is named Donna, and what we as the viewers are expected to believe is that she is suffering from side effects from Claire Drill, where it so happens to create another version of her with an alternate personality. An evil version of Donna, if you will. So far, all of that is true, but it gets deeper than that. If you take a close look at the background of the advertisement, you could see the other version of Donna in the background that exists because of her overtaking the Claridrill drug. So wait a minute, Donna's overtaking Claridrill? Yes, sir. Donna's car is full of empty boxes and canisters of nasal spray. Donna is a drug addict. You'll notice that while Donna is driving away from the park, the announcer for Claridrill's side effects starts to slowly fade, and if you take a look at Donna, it seems like she's starting to become very gloomy. But once she takes a quick nasal pass of Claridrill, the advertisement returns, the narrator is back, and Donna is as happy as can be. Meaning that her Claridrill kick was wearing off and she needed a quick hit. When Donna drives by the crime scene, you could see that there's a dead body with green sneakers on, and it's funny because the man yelling at the detectives is also wearing green sneakers. It's the same shoe. Wait, no. It's the same exact person. Remember how I said that a side effect of Claridrill is that it creates another crazy version of a person? Well, unfortunately for this man, he became a victim of Claridrill addiction. The man in the body bag is his former self, his sanity, while the angry lunatic yelling at detectives represents addiction and the crazy shit a person will do just to feel good. That evil version of the man killed his sanity, his former self, and from the looks of the blood bags leaving the man's house it seems like the evil alternate version of the man took some victims with him. And unfortunately the same situation is happening to Donna. Donna has an evil alternate that's slowly taking away her sanity, and well, just like in the video, Donna's evil twin ends up beating the snot out of her and backing over her with the minivan. Luckily, normal Donna is still alive, her sanity is still there. But it's too late to change the past. Donna's life is completely in the shitter now, and by the time Donna crawls back to a place of sanity, or I guess to her house, it's over. The damage has been done. Donna's addictive personality ruined her house and quite possibly murdered her children. Claridrill is supposed to be an allergy medication. Or was it? No. You see, Donna does sneeze in the commercial at the beginning of the video, but is she taking Claridrill for the sneezing? Because she seems pretty, I guess, depressed and alone more so than sick. Just like what happens when you put a cucumber in my ass, everything becomes bright and rejuvenating. Wait a minute, what? As if the depression just went away. But how does allergy medication do it? It doesn't. Allergy medication only treats allergy. Claridrill is a cover-up for antidepressant medication. According to Nightmind, real prescriptions for antidepressant medications don't have commercials, but Claridrill is an antidepressant support medication which acts as a multiplier and accelerator. They're used with antidepressant medications that patients feel aren't working strongly enough. However, these types of medications are not recommended by doctors. So wait a minute, Donna is depressed? But why? Well, the walls in the home paint the big picture. Pictures of kids and Donna, but no husband. Four chairs, but one is shot down. Donna is rambling about her dating life in the basement. Even to the littlest details in the background, like how Donna has one of those stereotypical soccer mom stickers on her back windshield, which usually displays white silhouettes of a father, a mother, siblings, and sometimes pets. But in Donna's case, there's only a mom and two kids representing herself and her daughter and son. There's a missing husband, and Donna is upset because of that. Donna is probably being treated for her depression, but isn't getting a strong enough dosage. So she's trying to, according to Nightmind, hijack the chemical process using Claridrill, which turns her into an addict. I could continue, but might I suggest just checking out Nightmind's video? The amount of information in his video is just incredible. He dives into the website details, and I just think it's well worth the watch. You're gonna learn more from his video than me. But yeah, the overall meaning of unedited footage of a bear is that drugs are just bad, and addiction is a serious problem. Naruto Sandbox Incident So Naruto has practically been a staple of Cartoon Network and Adult Swim for many, many years. Like, the original Naruto first aired on September 10th, 2005 on Toonami in the United States. Now, while this tragic story doesn't necessarily mention Adult Swim, Toonami, or Cartoon Network, Naruto was airing on the network at the time of the incident, so I suspect that the kid saw an episode of Naruto on Cartoon Network one night and decided that he wanted to recreate a certain stunt from the show. So I'm 
March 11, 2008, a 10-year-old boy from Washington State unfortunately passed away from injuries he obtained over that weekend when he buried his head in a sandbox during a playdate. The boy's playmates essentially buried him headfirst in a one-foot deep sandbox. The children who were playing with the boy assumed that he was joking around when he started to thrash around in the sandbox. The children did not realize that the boy was suffocating in the sandbox, but by the time they got help, the boy stopped breathing. CPR was attempted by adults at the house before emergency medical personnel arrived. However, despite the efforts to save the child, he unfortunately passed away two days later at a children's hospital. I suspect that the boy got his idea from a specific Naruto character, Gara of the Desert. Gara is known to use sand as a weapon to murder his enemies. Kids love to recreate fight scenes and cosplay as their favorite anime characters, so it's not really surprising that the kids at this play date wanted to recreate some Naruto scenes. It's just awful that this was the end to what started as an innocent play date with friends. The rest of the children were interviewed by the police and the case was ruled as a tragic accident. Nobody was charged, nobody got in trouble, there wasn't any sort of repercussions, Naruto continued to air on television. It really is a tragic tale, but we could just only hope that nothing bad like this situation ever happens again. C. Martin Crocker's Forbidden File So C. Martin Crocker should sound like a familiar name to most of you. That's because he was a very well-known animator and voice actor on many Adult Swim shows like Aqua Teen, Space Ghost Coast to Coast, The Brack Show, and Perfect Hair Forever. And unfortunately, on September 24th, 2016, Crocker suddenly became very ill, vomiting, and developing a fever. He believed it to be food poisoning from consuming sushi earlier in the day. After arriving home from an errand a few hours later, Crocker's partner found him unresponsive. He was pronounced dead by paramedics called to the residence minutes later. No cause of death has been publicly released. It was rumored that Crocker left behind a treasure trove of drawings, artwork, and various memorabilia. Crocker is said to have kept all of the artwork he ever created, making it plausible that his more not-safe-for-work material has been preserved. Yes, his dirty sketches. Two years after his death, so we're talking around 2018 now, Crocker's work has still not been recovered in its entirety. Apparently, he kept his not safe for work artwork in a forbidden file. Its contents are not known, but one of the drawings is believed to be Tom and Jerry scat porn. Yep. You heard that correctly. The image has been confirmed to exist by several of Crocker's peers, including Robert W. Pope, who is an artist for a large amount of the DC Comics, and Robert Minsk. Preservation efforts for the Forbidden File was led by Crocker's sister, Julia Thornton. So all of this information is coming from LostMediaWiki.com, but there's one thing I want to state before we continue. And that is that the Forbidden File isn't really lost media, but its existence is unconfirmed. According to a couple of guys close to Crocker, Robert W. Pope and Robert Minsk that were previously mentioned before, acknowledged the existence of the Forbidden File in this Facebook comment section of a post asking about some funny Crocker stories. So from my understanding or my belief, it seems like the file does exist, but nobody has fully unearthed it. It sounds like only Crocker showed pieces of his Forbidden File to people. But allegedly, somewhere there is a folder from Crocker with tons and tons of of crazy not safe for work drawings and by god we need to find this folder soon i mean it's 2022 my friends we could be knee deep in tom and jerry scat sketches i'm kidding by the way saved by the bell most of you have probably heard if not have seen the classic american sitcom saved by the bell that aired on nbc from 1989 to 1993 but did you know that the series actually aired on adult swim for a brief period of time specifically two weeks beginning on April 17th, 2006. Oh, you didn't know that? Well, guess what? Now you know, baby. Of course, with every single show on the Adult Swim Network, there's usually commercials or bumpers that correlate to the show to help promote it. But like almost every single bumper from my childhood, the Saved by the Bell bumpers have quite literally made me piss and shit my pants as a kid. I vividly remember being a six-year-old child and seeing these nightmarish bumpers in the middle of the night and being so petrified that I would actually get up and put on Nick at night, despite the fact that the George Lopez theme song also scared the shit and piss out of me as a kid. But here's the thing though, the George Lopez theme song was pretty tolerable at 4am. I was not going to continue to sit in the dark and watch this crap. I'm in my happy place. 
I'm in my happy place. I'm in my happy place. Although now that I'm looking back on some of these bumpers, they're pretty funny. Like anyone could just take clips from Saved by the Bell, throw them into Vegas Pro or Premiere Pro, throw on either an invert or sketch filter, hell, even a kaleidoscope filter, and just slow down the audio and video to make it seem like a fever dream. In fact, I kind of want to do that right now. So I threw this into Vegas Pro and I added in a kaleidoscope effect, but then I thought, hmm, why not make it even more terrible and put an invert filter on it? And then I said, you know what? We could get really fucking crazy with this. So I threw on an ecto filter to really brighten up the inverted colors. And now it looks like a giant pile of garbage. Anywho, we're getting off topic, Greg. Only eight episodes out of the 99 aired on Adult Swim as a stunt to ridicule live action programming on the network, even renaming itself to crappy 1980s live action. TV show network for the occasion. The episodes that did air on Adult Swim were The Gift, The Friendship Business, House Party, Jesse Song, Fake IDs, Rockumentary, Drinking and Driving, and Snow White and the Seven Dorks between April 18th and April 28th of 2006, all airing at 12 a.m. Now, as the first live action series on the network and Cartoon Network, reactions to the show airing were very negative, according to the Adult Swim message boards at the time. According to the Adult Swim Saved by the Bell wiki, a fake press release was posted on the Adult Swim website claiming that the network was going to revive the show under the direction of Matt Laster, the VIP of Turner Entertainment's newly created reclamation department claiming that the fans have really shown their support and come out in droves on the adultswim.com website. The purported reboot would feature Screech as Bayside's principal who, upon being overwhelmed by the current students, enlists the help of his friends. But it turns out the entire incident was a giant joke. Matt Laster was a real employee of William Street at one point, but he was not a VP. And on September 17th, 2019, after the news of a real reboot of Saved by the Bell was announced, Former writer Merle Hagen, who was in charge of the Adult Swim website at the time, revealed that he had made the fake press release as a joke intended mostly for the message board community. So it seems like the entire Saved by the Bell block that lasted for two weeks was just a giant joke to mock live action programming on the network. But damn, what a weird two weeks it was. This house has people in it meaning. If you guys have seen too many cooks and unedited footage of a bear, then you've 100% definitely seen this house has people in it. Just like I previously explained with the first two infomercials, this video could easily be interpreted just as an entertaining video, meant to screw with stoners and children at 4am, or something completely different. And look, I'm gonna be completely real with all of you, I don't believe that this house has people in it is a normal sketch for entertainment purposes. In fact, I believe it's kind of like an ARG which we've talked about earlier, and the reason why I'm calling it an ARG of sorts is because of yet another video uploaded by Nightmind. Nightmind spent over an hour and a half just trying to decipher what exactly the meaning behind this house has people in it, and he uncovers so many hidden layers, a website that takes you to a terminal which gives you access to over two hours worth of bonus footage that adds on to the story arc, of the original 11 minute short, and the only way you could get access to some of this footage is if you type in passwords that are layered within the original 11 minute video. It's a very long video, but Nightmind does such a great job explaining and piecing together the story of the shorts and why things are happening, and I highly recommend you just give it a watch after this video, of course. But please take my word for it, this house has people in it, has ARG elements. Now, the basic spark notes of Nightmind's video is that the family is infected with Link's disease that causes them to experience reality in a very distorted way, but the disease might be fake and represents the human ability to succumb to superstition. Essentially, Link's disease is just a disease of paranoia, and once you've heard of it, you too become paranoid that you've contracted it. You start to act like you have symptoms, even when you don't. I guess Link's disease is kinda like being a hypochondriac. Now, there's many ways of looking at pieces of art or media, but a person's perception will always be flawed due to a lack of information, and despite the fact that there is two additional hours of bonus content alongside the original video, there is a ton of context missing 
gaps are wide open in the story, and those can be up for interpretation. I believe that the message Nightmind is trying to convey is that at the end of the day, none of us will fully understand the perception of this house as people in it the way the creators of the short see it. So even though we are left to brainstorm and create our own answers as to what exactly the meaning or explanation of this video may be, let's actually take a look at a few different ideas created by people who have seen this house as people in it. Realistically, your guess is as good as mine. This house is about a birthday party gone wrong. This house allows users to sink into the floor and literally become the living manifestation of this house has people in it. Literally, the house has people in the walls and floors. This video might also be a metaphor for child neglect. According to Emma Rose, the pink monster hidden in the original video might be the personification of neglect, which is why it torments the parents in particular, showing them their failures through not providing bedsheets to their son, and that it also resides in the junk room where items are neglected. Cinema Chameleon suggests that this video is just a Sims live action short with characters acting and reacting like real people but with all of the underlying absurdity of a video game, namely one plagued by glitches. This idea by Mika Orange suggests that carbon monoxide might be playing a big role in the madness of the house which explains why Tom and Anne, the parents, barely notice the most bizarre events happening right in front of them. And a symptom of carbon monoxide is confusion which could be what is going on here. But the scariest explanation that I've heard regarding this house has people in it is that it takes place in Florida. Holy shit, now that is pretty fucking spooky, bro. But like I stated before, definitely check out Nightmind's video. He does a great job diving into the little details that you don't even notice. Personally, I don't even believe that Nightmind fully uncovered what's underneath the surface of this house has people in it. I'll tell you, boy. That video gets deep. But that, my friends, was the final layer of the iceberg. Alright, we did it again, kids. I think this iceberg project took longer to develop than my past three iceberg videos, and that's not an exaggeration at all. I should have had this video out on like June 15th or something, but the writing and editing just took way too long, plus researching topics as well. But I hope all of you guys can at least forgive me for the long delay of this video. Hopefully I can get the next one out faster. Honestly, a lot of these entries could just be icebergs in themselves, so if there's anything you want me to cover in like maybe an analysis video or something, then let me know in the comments below. But regardless, I hope you all enjoyed this iceberg video. If you did, then leave a like, subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon, follow me on all of my social links, and join my zesty flaming hot discord server. Links are in the description below. Have a great day everyone, and remember that adult swim is deep like a pussy. I'm starting to hate that word.